Hello, all you Freddy Maniacs out there. This is Benjamin Dutill, your awesome horror host of the Horror Heathen YouTube channel and the South Jersey Horror Podcast. Today, I have a very awesome and special and honored guest, Ken Sayals, which you all know as Kincaid from A Nightmare on Street Part 3. A quick bio on this awesome individual, very impressive resume, and it's fantastic overall. Um, you were born in Stockbridge, Georgia, raised in Atlanta. You are an award-winning writer and actor who has received over 100 film, TV, and stage credits. You attended Kennesaw State University and studied writing and directing under the UCLA Extension Program. You also studied under two entertainment legends, Edmund Cambridge and Marlon Brando. That is very, very cool. And you're a former staff writer with Paramount Television, won a Cable Ace Award, and was a Humanist Prize finalist for writing and co-starring in Disney Channel's On Promised Land. You have written 14 plays, over 35 screenplays. As a stage actor, you have received several awards, including the NAACP Theater nomination for Ted Lang's critically acclaimed play, George Washington's Boy. Right. In film, you are best known for the role of Kincaid, one of the dream warriors in the classic horror films on Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and 4, making you the first African-American actor to survive a major horror film and return for a sequel, which you do not see a lot in horror movies, and that's what makes it very special for you. You are also known for John Singleton's Rosewood as the lovable big baby and the role of Daryl, with Martin Lawrence in the hit series, What's Happening Now? Um, I could go on. I mean, what did you do? Seriously, because this is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, you won 94 awards, nominated for eight, 27 awards alone in 2022. And already this year, at the Milan Gold Awards, you won the August Silver Award for producer and screenplay for what The Secret Weapon Yesterday is Today. I did? You did, according to INDB, you did. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Very impressive, and congratulations on your awesome career. I, I'm very impressed. I'm not going to lie. It takes a lot to impress me. So, ladies and gentlemen, the awesome Mr. Kincaid himself, Ken Sagos. How are you doing, sir? I, I am doing well, but let me uh, make one thing very clear before we get started. I know... You were saying that I'm awesome, awesome about what I have done, but I have always believed that who I am is because of you. And so I, I'm not one of those people who want to take credit. I have to give what credit is due. And who I am, it's not me alone. It's because the fans and the people believed in me, believed in my work. They was the win beneath my wings. So thank you and to everybody who's saying this first. My first thanks is to God and then to you. So thank you. Very much appreciated. Wise philosophy. And it's fantastic to have you on my show. It's a true honor. And you are one of my favorite actors in the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. And I was so sad to see you go. I wish you were a <laughs> lot more. Yeah. <laughs> you were sad. <laughs> I, I, I wish I wish Wes Craven would have kept you more, but I guess the way the writers did it, it, it was very really sad to see. So, yeah, you know, I, I think the thing is, it's not that it was sad to see me go. It was the blessing that I could do something that people did not want to see me go. <laughs> so I look at that, look at it that way. I cried because it was my last check. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me. So talking about Not Martin Elm Street Part Three and Four. So when you first heard about the role, were you personally selected for it or did you have to audition? I had to audition because I had not I didn't know anything about Nightmare on Elm Street. I had never seen a movie. Um really talked about Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, and so when 
I was to go out for the road. I didn't want to go because that particular day I had to go to court and it was raining. It was like pouring. It was like it was like God had a picture just pouring water down. And I had to go to court. I didn't have a car. And the audition was way across town and the court was way uptown. So I had to get the bus and I lost the case, by the way. <laughs> so I was really angry. I didn't want to be there. So when I got there, they was running late. My thing is I just want to go up and come back in and catch that next bus home. But it was running behind. So when I went into the audition, I had an attitude. I really did have an attitude. Because you got to see, back then, when... An actor went out for something. They they had the, those things, what they do today, called breakdowns, where they describe the character. And I didn't fit what they were looking for. My agent only wanted me to go there to meet the cast and director for another upcoming project. So I went in with an attitude. I didn't want to be there. And, and God willing, they were looking for a young actor with an attitude. <laughs> and that don't want to be there and I didn't want to be there so it was awful but you got the part that's, that's all it counts <laughs> I got the part and I, I remember telling uh, Chuck Russell the director that a black guy wouldn't say this so he said say it how a black guy would say it so I kind of cussed him out and <laughs> He said, thank you. When I left and by the time I got home, my agent had called, I don't know how many times. Um, that was back there when they had them big answering machines. And I, as soon as I walked in the door, the phone was still ringing. And I picked up the phone and he said, what the hell did you do? And I said, <laughs> I told you I didn't want to go. And he said, they loved you. You got your part. <laughs> so I tell you, you're very excited knowing you could be part of the movie. And very excited because I it was my first big role. It was my first starring role. Uh, I had recently been blessed doing a project with uh, Denzel Washington where I was a kid in a, a co-star role. Very nice. And this just came and it was, it seemed like everybody knew about Nightmare on Elm Street, but me, I did not know. Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I wasn't a horror fan, but I had a favorite horror movie, which was The Birds. And I had had the honor of meeting Mr. Alfred Hitchcock before he passed because I worked as a security guard at Universal Studios in 1979, in the early 1979. As a matter of fact, it was, I want to say it was like April the 13th. It was a Friday the 13th in 1979. Out of all days, Friday the 13th. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I want to say it was April, you know, that been, what, 40 years ago. Now, but anyway, I was, and I got a chance to meet a lot of the old legends. Right. Who taught them things and words and wisdom of how to survive? That there was not a small role, there's a small actors. And I truly love what I do and I wanted to make it work. And I was taught that if it wasn't anything out there for you, and don't complain about what other everybody else is writing. You pick up a pencil and you write this shit yourself. <laughs> so <coughs> that was my. It's it's fantastic. You're a legend in my eyes. You are elite status in the Hollywood industry. I'm sorry, it's just because of what you do. So. Well, I, I believe in giving back. And as a matter of fact, I, I'm preparing to do an event where I can give out some more scholarships. I, I give out at least 10 scholarships 
every year to college bound students and I try to send some kids to summer camp every summer. Uh, the things that I did not have the privilege of having when I was growing up, I promised God and I promised those who helped me that I was going to give back. And that's the, the name of my nonprofit, Giving Back. And so I want to do it. So to all the fans out there who have supported me and continue to support me whenever I'm doing these fundraisers or doing these short films, you have helped me put over 700 kids through college. That so is fantastic. I don't say I did it by myself. And I honestly believe that the horror community is the most caring and the gather and brotherhood group of them all. Oh, absolutely. I agree 100%. I, I, it, it's so much easier to talk to actors who start in horror movies than it is to like action and sci-fi. I mean, I've tried in the past. And I've always been rejected by those who are like in action movies or sci-fi movies. But when it comes to horror movies, people are, are like, they're, they're thrilled to be on my show because it's so they're so easy to talk to. And yeah, I, I think that, you know, I, I get advice to be on a lot of shows in case some people out there are looking. And I very rarely turn something. I, I don't think I ever would turn it down. What I have turned down is the time that I could do it. Right. Um, you know, I had to be in big red. You know, <laughs> it was important to me to do this, you know, for you to take the time to reach out, do this for me. And then sometimes, you know, we asked about what is your viewership and something like this here. You know, as long as it three people, I'll do it. As long as it's me, <laughs> You and one other person, that's enough. Because you know what? At the end of the day, one person can change the world. That is correct. And you're being an aspiring actor as you, I would follow your wisdom any day. I take your <laughs> advice. You know, so. I'm still an inspiring actor. <laughs> I still have to go out on auditions. I'm, I'm, I, I kind of pushed myself away from acting the past couple of years, few years, because I wanted to get behind the scene and direct. And so now I'm eager to get back out in front of the camera. So if any of you directors, writers, have a role you want me, Ken K, call me. <laughs> Gotta pay me or not. I know a few directors I can get in touch with, so I'll, 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 re I'll reach out to them. <laughs> I, I, but it has to be a sad thing. It has to be a sad film, you know, uh, because I work so hard to get in the union and I ain't going to get out of it. But no, I, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the, being on the set. I enjoy being with new directors. Most people turn their heads at new directors. But what I've learned that all the old directors was once new directors. And as for me, you don't forget those who were there for you in the beginning. So I don't want people to forget me when I need a job. I'm sure they won't forget you. <laughs> <laughs> so my next question is, um, can you tell us in your own words, what was like playing the lovable, the Hercules style Kincaid in both films? Um. Once I got into Kincaid, it was a joy to be able to do something that I wasn't in real life. It was a joy to work side to side with a creative character that had a piece of me in it, that I could put a piece of me in it, but embody what the great late Wes Craven and others wrote for me to be a part of. And I literally enjoyed it. What I loved about it is that I did not know it at the time, 
the importance of the role that I was playing, you know, being an African-American man, a man of color, young man of color, and was doing a film that survived the Harvard film because very few of us had survived at that time. But even more, to survive and come back in that character. So it was, Kincaid was a character that had reachable dreams. You know what I mean? The others had dreams that I love, but he had reachable dreams. He had the gift to talk back to Freddie on his own level. He had the strength, something that you can go out there and you can prepare with and you can do it. Personally, I think if they had had Ken K head on him and Freddie, he would have gave Freddie a sincere run for his money. <laughs> I believe Ken K would definitely win a fight and Freddie would have no chance. <laughs> yeah, and, and what I liked about playing the character is that Ken K, he was strong. He wasn't afraid, but he was afraid. And if, in my eyes, he fought when you pushed him in a corner. He didn't mess with anyone until you messed with him. Until he was pushed in the corner. Uh, he had realness that everybody could relate to. And that's the thing that people tell me all over the world that they related to Ken Cade because his dreams was reachable and he believed in something and he was not going to go down without a fight. So I believe that. I believe that a lot of people have connected with that character. Yeah. And were able to see him as a role model. And in in a I don't know, um a philosophical aspect, I, I believe I think your character may have changed a lot of lives too. So I get that. I, I, I do get that. And, you know, and I embrace that with love the, uh, because I think it was something. I don't know if that's what Res Craven, um, Chuck Russell set out to do, uh, Bob Shea, you know, uh, uh, who was the owner of New Line, they set out to do, but that's what happens. I know for myself as a writer, when you write things and I write a character and sometimes the character is so good that i am just become a vessel for the character and I'm writing what the character wants. And I think that was one of the brilliancies of Dream Warriors. It's because each one of us had our own world. It tackled homeliness, it tackled Friendship, it tackled um, people with mental illness, it tackled everything. And then we all came together as one force, one force. And we worked together, we unity. And I always say that Chuck Russell did something that I feel was very brilliant. He got us all together before we filmed that first scene. So we became friends before we got to the set. So when we got to the set and started filming, we all had an investment in togetherness, an investment in friendship. So some of those things that we were saying was not real. I mean, was not fake, it was real. I wanted Helva to do be good. I wanted, you know, Ira. I wanted Rodney. I wanted Jennifer, Penelope. We all wanted each other to be good because we was behind each other. And that's what made it. We was a team. And we was in a corner and we was going to fight. Nobody believed us because we was in a mental institution. I can somewhat relate to that being a military veteran who suffers from PTSD and anxiety. And I, th I think that's how I connected so well with this movie and all the other characters. And I know your character inspired a lot of veterans to overcome their difficulties and challenges. Yeah. yeah so. I, I, and I, I didn't understand it until of recent years. 
when someone sat me down and talked with me and related it to me um, and related to me about why Nightmare on Elm Street Dream Warriors was so important to them. And because at the time I was just doing a film, at the time I didn't know that I was representing people all over the world, people of color, and not just people of color, but just people, period, who was down in a depressed mode and needed something to lift them up. And all they had was that inside of themselves. And I think Ken K went inside of himself and brought out his strength. In order to bring out the kind of strength he had, he had to believe in something. And he believed that he was going to kick Freddie's ass all over Dreamland. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So, yeah. Um, I got I know you got something you got to do, so I want to wrap this up. Now I'm going to hold you back. I'm going to talk, just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, it's true. I mean, what was it like working with Lawrence Fishburne? Because he is another legendary actor. Oh, man. I don't see him <clears throat> I haven't seen him, I think, about maybe once or twice since then. But I always, always credit Lawrence Fishburne as a brother that came to the set, saw that I needed some training, saw that he was not going to let me embarrass myself in this film and took me to the side and talk to me about how I could be a better actor, especially in physical acting. It may not have meant that much to him, but I still take that advice and I live it today. So it was an honor to work with him. You hear and that, people? Great words. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, um, I've learned because of my upbringing and where I come from, I learned to appreciate the presence of someone, the smile of someone, because we had absolutely nothing. I hate to sound like Whitney Houston's son. I had nothing, nothing, nothing. But I think because of that, I learned to look upward. And, right, right. And to try, and when you look upward you look down at the valley not look in a negative way but look how beautiful the valley is when you're looking from the at the top of the trees so i i learned to look at those things that everything is connected per se and that's why i've learned to grow i i, I didn't understand what when people say when the elderly people say wisdom comes now I understand it. I wasn't wise enough to grab it and hold on to it when I was in my teens, when I was in my early 20s, to grab that wisdom and do it then because they knew I had to ride life a little. You know. I get it. I, get it. I interviewed um, Ray Don Chong yesterday, and she said almost the exact same thing you just did. So <laughs> it's great. So, um, According to IMDb, you have a project in development called Lower Lake. So uh, that's not my project. That's somebody else's project. My project is it's not on it. It's called Socrates. Okay. It's a horror film. I want to I want to die with my first horror film. I set out three years ago to. Um, direct three short films. I directed one called The McKinley Trial about a young African-American kid who got his law degree when he was 14. He was a brilliant young kid. Um, and his first case was defending his father who had been accused of murder. And he'd go up against this high power law firm. My second film which is out now, short film, is called The Secret Weapon. Yesterday is today. It's about the children in 1963 
who gave the power back to the civil rights movement, who came to the rescue of Dr. King, Reverend Fred Shuttleworth, and all those great civil rights leaders at the time. And by the way, this year is the 60th, the 60th anniversary of that little movement protest that they had. Now, my third film, short film, is called Socrates. And it's about a parrot, a talking parrot who has been possessed and they have awakened him and he's out to kill. And it's my tribute to Alfred Hitchcock, to the great William Marshall, who played Blackula, and to Rex Craven, because the parrot talks. He has a sense of humor and he's a killer. It sounds like fun. I need to, I want to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, it, it got a little Freddy in there. It got a little everything. In there. And he talks, you know, and he controls his territory. And he has seen through the years and century of slavery. And so now he's out to get revenge on everybody. The slave owner, the, the descendants of the slave owners, the descendants of the slave who would not help other slaves get away. So nobody is safe. <laughs> and so a talking parrot hell bent on revenge. It sounds like a great synopsis. <laughs> and his 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 his, um, <coughs> his claws grow like razors when he get ready to kill you. So like a Freddy claw, pretty much. <laughs> and I'm doing the voice. <coughs> I'm doing a voice. It's my first voiceover. And he's like, come at me, come at me. <laughs> so, ah, gonna kill you. I am looking forward to seeing that. That looks, that sounds great. I'm gonna have my um, GoFundMe fundraiser to raise money because I wanna have some CGI in here. And that's expensive. So I need to raise about seven grand to do this for him. And I'm going to do it. You know, so when I, I reach out and ask my nightmare films uh, fans to send me a dollar. Please do. You're gonna, you, um, I want to do make it a feature film, but I want to show you where I'm coming from now. You're gonna love it. I'm sure I will. I'm, I'm, I'm stoked already just by hearing what you said about it. <laughs> yes. So I got thank two. You, thank you for allowing me to be here doing Black History Month. That's it. Oh yeah, that. totally. Um, I'm here to celebrate black actors and horror movies. That's the main goal for this month. Thank you. So, and you, believe it or not, you were the first person I thought of. I had to reach out to. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> so, I got two favors to ask from you. Uh, two small favors. Um, can you say the line from the movie where you're calling out Freddy Krueger? Hey, Freddy, where you at, you black face pussy? <laughs> I love that. that that line just like cracks me up every time I watch the movies <laughs> that was one of those lines that uh, the director when I told him that you know you know because he had me saying something else I don't I think that was one of the ad libs that he let me do and the second favor is um, my friend Jason loves you very much he admires you what you do not only in Hollywood but also during your personal time I just wanted you to say like a quick hello to Jason for me. Where is Jason now? Um, he lives in Sicklerville, New Jersey. Where is he? Give me his number. Give me. Oh, okay. Um, give me his number. See how he, Give me his number. I, I can't say it in the video. I'm going to have to email it to you. <laughs> well, you, can't, you can't send it to me right now some type of way? Um, I, after this interview, I can send it to you. I was gonna call him on the phone while we was here. See? See? Oh, um, yeah. I got a. Uh, okay, is I got. He, is he home? I have no idea. Send it to me on the email right quick. See, we're gonna do this. You send it to him. Uh, let me log in real quick. You, ex you didn't expect that, did you? No, I did not <laughs> at all. I keep you for having me on here.
we doing all this, Jason better have his behind home. So how old is Jason? How old is he or how's he doing? Both. Um, how old is Jason? He's about four years older than me. I went to high school with him. Okay. I just sent his number. An email. To my email? Yes. See how they eat that? Let me see can I get it. I don't go no, don't you go nowhere. Okay. How do I get back to you? Oh, there you are. We call him right now. Okay. This is the answer to his phone or not. <laughs> <laughs> you, pro you probably think it's a creditor. <laughs> Message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press one for more options. Hi, Jason. This is Ken Sagos, Ken Kate. We was on, I was doing a Zoom with your buddy here. And so I, I he told me that you enjoyed my work. So I said, give me his number so I can call him. He didn't believe me. So I'm calling you. You missed out, man. So I want to thank you for appreciating my work. I appreciate you and everybody else. So again, uh, one day we got to go kick Freddy's ass all over Dream Man. <laughs> all right. Fucking <laughs> so Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you so much. He's going to love that. Thank you. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you. And I appreciate all that you do. And I wish you nothing but the best in your career. And I'm, I'm going to keep following you. So. And, and, and I hope you ask me back. Absolutely. Will do. Ladies and gentlemen, the amazing Ken Sagals, also known as Kincaid. Such an honor and a pleasure with this elite status actor in Hollywood. Thank you so much for joining me on my show, and I wish you the best. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Take care. <laughs>